Leading Frontiers Fireside Chat. And we're thrilled to have uh, Jacob Stoller here. And uh, let me give you a little background on, on Jacob. He's a journalist, a speaker, a facilitator, and a Shingo Prize winning author from his book, um, The Lean CEO. But today we're gonna to be talking about his latest book, Productivity Reimagined, which will be released in October, so coming up soon. He's also published uh, hundreds of articles on technology and business management methods, and he's known for demystifying complex topics for general business audiences. Also, he delivers a lot of keynote um, talks and learning events uh, throughout the Canada, the US, and Europe, and actually is keynoted at the uh, Lean Frontiers Summit as well. So we're thrilled to have him here, and we're going to be talking, like I said, talking about um, uh, based on the work he's done on his new book coming up. The title of this webinar is you know, Productivity, Myths, and Reality. So Jacob, to start it off here, um, oh, one thing let me say real quick. If you have any questions as we go along, you could place them into the chat uh, feature or in the Q&A uh, feature on uh, the Zoom here. But uh, Jacob, to get started, um, why productivity? What, what led you to write about this and research into it? Ah, great question, Jim. Well, I guess we'll start with the lean CEO and 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 where that wound up. I mean, it was a sort of an investigation of uh, the sort of the the senior uh, boardroom uh, approach to lean. I was very interested in that. And uh, what I wound up with, like, you know, I thought there might be some executive playbook, but um, my conclusions were that it was more about attitudes. You know, I think there were some beliefs that people had um, and often that they'd had all their life or very early in their life that that actually made them very strong leading leaders. So I got interested in, the, in that question, um, what makes those beliefs and what are the beliefs behind rejecting lean? Because there are a lot of people that don't want to do it. Um, and I found, because um, I do, I, I write on a lot of subjects, lean and, and otherwise, and I found that there are a lot of people that run into the same barriers, you know, whether they're doing uh, sustainability initiatives, whether they're doing, trying to implement technology, whether they're doing anti-poverty type efforts. So there's a, a lot of common ground and a lot of common ground in barriers in the kind of the walls, um, if you will, that, that people run into when they're trying to transform a company. So I really wanted to look at that. And I found that the, uh, the nexus point for all this is productivity um, at the, the most fundamental level. You know, it's this productivity where we really want to do more with less. We want to increase our output with the same set of inputs, right? And we want to move forward with that. So that was the meeting point. And um, uh, so I started looking at attitudes and, and practices around productivity, what the barriers are that people run into, uh, then compare it between people in lean transformations and, and uh, outside of that. Okay, no, that's good. And then I certainly relate to this just, um, you know, with one with my background prior to Lean Frontiers was engineering and operations and manufacturing engineering specifically. So working on developing system, improving system to make productivity better. So mm -hmm. I always have been fascinated, you know, in, very interested in this. Um, as you did the research and talk with people and so forth, are there, were there some key kind of key elements that uh, that you found, or maybe even key barriers. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and let me start with uh, what I would call this. I guess the I call this the myth of segmented success. But it's this idea that you can have uh, a bunch of subsystems, you know, within a company, you know, departments, whatever you have, and if each one is successful, then the whole company will be successful, right? Um, and of course, everybody, probably all our audience knows what about flow, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, but uh, people actually believe that from when they're, they're kids and, and uh, it actually enables the whole uh, system of financial logic because, uh, you know, if, if everything is additive and the whole equals to some of the parts, it's very easy to just, you know, you can just look at the, at the financial reports and it's going to tell you everything you need to know. Um, about a company and about its operations, but of course that's that's really not the case. But it's surprisingly hard for people to unlearn that, um, at whether they're doing lean or not. I mean, I found that, for example, in environmental engineering, where you look at uh, you're an engineer, but you look at you know electrical engineers, 
mechanical engineers, uh, chemical engineers, they all look at the world sort of differently. And when they do projects, uh, it's often they'll do one thing, like they'll figure out how to save electricity, but they won't look at all the heat losses, uh, et cetera. So a lot of these projects, and they're, by the way, they're tendered that way, they're, they're done that way, uh, tend to not look at the big picture. So again, that's just another example of this kind of segmented thinking that's just, you know, all through our culture, really. So it sounds like the uh, holistic look and approach. I'm assuming that is often difficult for organizations and leaders and people in organizations to understand that, grasp that, and actuate on it. Yeah. Well, you know what? What the, the way I, I I sort of see it, maybe most graphically, is that. Uh, you know, when you talk to very, you know, large companies, um, people uh, see operations as a black box, right? Um, so, uh, and and people, senior, you know, a lot of the senior executives don't want to know what happens in that black box. They say, well, that's operations. Your job is to make that work. And uh, they don't want to understand it. But the, but the tricky part is that you get this divide between, I guess, really sort of two cultures, because... Uh, you know, inside the box uh, operations is really where the magic happens. You know, that's where, let's say, if I reduce the timeline um, in half, well, the defects are going to decrease. But, you know, an accountant is going to tell you you're crazy. Or, you know, you tell them if you invest in quality, your costs are going to go down. Well, they'll think you're nuts because what they're thinking outside the box is that everything is they see you get what you pay for, right? We want quality. We pay for that. We want to get faster delivery. We pay for that. Uh, we want to reduce costs. Well, we better get rid of some people, you know, lower our headcount. So, you know, it's, I think maybe the challenge that we're all facing is how do we get more people thinking inside that box and understanding that this non-financial logic is really uh, what's going to determine if you can grow your productivity. Yeah. That, you saying that made me think of the next question, but also too, it sounds like yeah, a lot of organizations will just, well, we need to reduce costs and so we'll chop heads, but ultimately in the long run, that actually can um, uh, reduce your productivity, although they may initially reduce your costs a little bit, but actually does a lot of damage to your productivity. Just um, you lose some knowledge. You certainly don't create a good morale in the organization as well. Sure it does, but that's all invisible in the financial. Yeah. So with that, because you kind of touched on it, what what do what do some people get wrong in, in light of productivity? Well, they they again they they hang on to that belief. I think they 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 don't know what they don't know. I guess would be the big thing. You know, they're not willing to to sort of adopt a new way of thinking, which is uh, really getting inside that operations box. Um, I think there's also uh, you know there are a lot of uh, incentives for them to keep thinking that way, right? And all their peers are thinking that way. And a lot of folks who've been taught, you know, they've gone to university and they've been taught that with my degree, I can lead a team and I can tell people what to do. And I better know what they're all doing because uh, that's my job. So this idea that, that, you know, one of the myths I look at, this idea that uh, the boss knows best or the professional knows best, is just very, very deeply ingrained um, and again, not just in companies, not just in corporations, but, you know, if you look at the, uh, the anti-poverty uh, sector, you know, the, the helping sector in the U.S., you know, they're just thousands of people that are trained as social workers that they, uh, so that they can tell poor people how to get out of poverty, advise them, you know, whereas that's, you know, hasn't worked. And, uh, but it's still, it's a, you know, that old thinking dies hard. I guess, you know, what I would say, Jim, is that unlearning is really hard. I think it's probably un harder to unlearn old habits than to learn new ones. Yeah, that's certainly something common we've seen. You know, I've seen, we've seen Link Frontiers over the years of people coming to our events, trying to figure out how do they get their organization and even leadership, as you're talking about, to unlearn that, which mm -hmm. you kind of touched on this too. And, and actually somebody submitted a question kind of related to this. Um, maybe the counter to that you talk about as people go to universities and learn from there. They ask, um, how can universities better support productivity efforts in industry? Oh, gosh. Well, <laughs> it could be a whole other webinar, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think it would. But, you know, I mean, there are, there are universities that have, um, 
uh, you know, a lot of sort of where you spend a lot of time in workplaces and then you come back, you go back and forth. I think that's good. I think Ohio State does that with their lean program. But uh, also, I think getting diversity and variety in their training. I mean, the, my understanding of MBA programs is that it's a lot of, it's very specialized. You know, it's you, you specialize in finance or whatever, and they don't have a lot of general courses in, in business schools. So I think that would be um, one of the things you got to do. You really need a broader sense of, you know, type of knowledge and certainly operations. I mean, everybody who gets an MBA should understand some of these basics that we're talking about with operations. Yeah, I know that's something in just in my university education engineering, I got lot, taught a lot about the technical aspects and all that, but, but never anything, certainly not overtly in how does that translate into you know, productivity improvements, making things more productive. Mm -hmm. And I kind of ran into that after I got out into industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, I'm not surprised. So um, as you were going through your, I guess your study and research and writing the book, did you have any uh, particular aha moments during, during the process? Oh gosh, you know, I had, I had quite a few because I do, uh, you know, I, I learn a lot when I do these things, but uh, so I guess I, I, I was one of the things I, I was sort of encouraged by was uh, some of the, some of the uh, Deming people that I talked with, uh, people following the Deming principles uh, to transform their companies. And they did that and they achieved a lot of the things that, that you know, we see with Lean. Um, um, you know, it, taking a different approach, but, but it still works, you know, which, you know, again, I think to me, it reinforces that there's just some fundamentals here. You know some fundamental beliefs that uh, that people need to have, I think, to move their company forwards, uh, or fundamental understandings, I guess, of human nature, the way systems work. Um, you know, just a sense of uh, statistics. You know, I mean, the probabilities of failure and things like that. I mean, there's just a lot of things in our brains that uh, we need to fix. Uh, I, I'm just rambling here, but you know, the the Kahneman and Swirsky. Uh, thinking fast and slow. I think a lot of people in the lean world have read that, but I think it's just, it shows how our thinking, um, how we get false ideas about things and we just run with them. And, um, you know, so I think we need maybe a little bit of shaking up. Yeah, have you found, I guess, have you found certain parts of the organization, um, I guess maybe looking at both, are either been more anti-productivity improvements or more that are pro-productivity improvements? I know we just run across, you know, people that come to our events over the years and they say, mm -hmm. you know, we're doing pretty good in, in our arena, but we're having trouble with this area of the organization, things like that. Did you, in your research, did you find any patterns or anything like that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I see the patterns a lot in, in the struggles that, that people went through uh, when they were going. And, and I think uh, one of them that I think is, is really important is that that uh, a lot of people have uh, initiated Lean as a sort of an engineering exercise and then run into the wall in terms of culture and, and getting people to adopt it. So I, I, think, um, I think the culture first, the people that have gone with culture first, I think have been very, very successful at an early stage. So I would say that was one of the uh, you know, big learning moments for me there. On the, on the culture, and any, and any particular things specifically that uh, organizations should look at from their culture. I know culture can be a fairly broad. Sure. Oh, you right. Yeah. Okay. Sure. I mean, I mean, let's, first of all, I think what we're talking about with productivity in an organization is teams, team productivity, you know, so we have to get away from individual profit, pro productivity, superstars, people who, uh, you know, would solve, big hairy problems and save the day and all this kind of thing. We need much, much more of a team approach. So that's, I think, there. Uh, but to build a uh, kind of team productivity, it takes a lot of trust, right? Yeah. You have to build trust, not just trust in management, but people have to trust each other. Um, so I think that takes some transition um, to do that. But, uh, you know, I would say that when you do that first and say, we're going to try to change this company, but Let's work on some just trust building here and what we want to do, and then we can start to train on, on some of the some of the tools and stuff like that. I should add though that it also has to be clear management has to provide clarity of where they're going and what the purpose is. I mean, you can't 
can't just say our purpose is to make money for shareholders. That doesn't provide purpose for employees. Yeah. You have to know what you're trying to do to your customers and be able to convey that message. And then I think you're in the position to start, you have the, the why, and then you think you're in the, the position to be able to present uh, some of the methods um, of, of, it, of achieving that. Yeah, one thing, I certainly one thing we've noticed in the last number of years is a lot of organizations have put more emphasis on an effort to, to help transform their culture is uh, in around different skills. Like you've seen a lot with, with coaching skills, mm -hmm. um, TWI training within industry skills, and uh, even Toyota Kata, um, yeah. a lot in order to help develop the skills in order to, um, again, take it away from the individual effort. Although they work on individuals to get the skills, it's in the context of how do we get the team and groups of people, you know, so horizontally and vertically to, to function better together. Oh yeah. And they, they are, those, those leadership skills are obviously very, very, you have to start early and, and they're very hard to learn um, for sure. And uh, one statistic, a couple of companies I talked to, I said in that process of, of uh, transitioning managers to more of a coaching role, they lost half their management teams. Hmm. Uh, you know, and that's, um, you know, so it is, it is a challenge, but I think both of, both of these companies told me that it was their fault. They, had, they hadn't prepared leaders for the kind of change that, that they were going to have to live with. Again, it's saying, I don't care if you graduated magna cum laude in engineering or whatever, um, your job is going to be, you know, your knowledge is not what we, we want. Our people, you know, in your leadership, we want your leadership skills. We want you to uh, encourage your people to use their knowledge and develop their knowledge. And that's worth 10 times as much as you telling them what to do every time. Are you seeing companies trend more to doing that or majority or just a few yet? Or kind of where's industry? I don't say by industry, I don't mean necessarily just manufacturing industry. I mean, industry overall, whether it's healthcare, banking, manufacturing, or whatever? I, you know, I, I did not interview companies that weren't doing this. I mean, I, I did kind of cherry pick, I guess, and that's maybe the weakness in my, <laughs> from a research standpoint, but uh, just anecdotally, I mean, from what people tell me, and, uh, you know, of course, these companies do business with other companies. Um, it's pretty unusual to have people becoming managers in that coaching role. I, I, I think it's still a minority. Okay, so minority, yeah. I, I guess we kind of see something similar, although we do see companies working on the effort, maybe not yeah. yet, but working on the effort to try to get themselves there with a lot of struggles and uh, roadblocks. From mm -hmm. and you know, obviously, obviously, our generally our crowd that we talk to, our audience, um, mm -hmm. we have our people that are involved in, in lean. Do you do you see some from some of the lean efforts? I guess not. We're saying the skills we talked about other lean efforts that companies do or help them get in a better position to, uh, to improve their productivity? Um, is there a, like a sequence or it just depends on the company? Yeah, I mean, I think productivity is really, it, it's, you know, if you really are talking about doing more with the resources you have, uh, that's, uh, that's the bottom line for, for, for lean improvement, right? You know, is we really are making better quality, uh, et cetera. Uh, more quantity with the, with the resources we have. That's 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 kind of where it. Uh, that's what sustains it, right? So I think there's a certain bias there. The ones that are still around, when you look at the yeah. older leading companies, are the ones that have succeeded in doing that because that's your engine for profitability, right? Yeah. Uh, and then, are you are you seeing some fundamental key efforts at those companies that are more successful that they're doing in regards to? You know, improving their productivity is there is are there elements that those companies tend to focus on or put better effort into? Well, again, you know, I, I think culture is obviously always underestimated, and I think you know the idea of developing culture uh, is is you know just so essential. But I think there's also uh, you know there there it, it's not you, you know. To get productivity, you have to you do have to manage some other things. Well, clearly, I mean, uh, you know, as 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 you see with something like Toyota, you know, I mean, capacity management, uh, for example, is is very very important, right? I mean, if you're got, I don't care how good you are, 
uh, with your lean efforts and your productivity. If you're only, you know, you're only at eighty percent capacity and you're making cars, you know, you're you're going to be <laughs> in pretty rough shape, right? Yeah. So that's a that's another thing that has to work in parallel with it. Um, you know, I, the other thing, of course, would be you know with with technology, and, and you, you and I talked about that a bit, but uh, you know, being able to adopt the right kind of technology where you're 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 staying, um, you know, with the curve, you're not getting yourself at a competitive disadvantage, but at the same time, um, you know, you've got to be getting a decent return on assets for that that technology, you know, and I think there's a lot of failed technology projects and there's a lot of misaccounting for technology. You know, I think again, people go back to the segmented approach with technology where they say, okay, you know, we can take this chunk of functionality and we can replace that with robots. And, you know, tech firms will tell you, you can do that. But, uh, you know, the old days of mass production, I mean, where you automate all the big mass high volume things are, you know, that's all in the past. I mean, that's been done. But today, you know, you're looking at high mix, low volume production. Um, where, you know, that things are changing all the time, you know, I mean, people tell me they had three variations on project, on a product, now they have 200, right? Um, so, uh, there's a lot more need for that kind of fluidity and there's a lot to managing that. Um, then there's of course supply chains, you know, where yeah. you can go wrong. You have great lean company and, uh, you know, you can get totally destroyed by, by, by your suppliers. And you, you gave me some great examples of that, you know, the need for looking at the whole supply chain and flow through the supply chain and how people yeah. got that wrong during the pandemic. Yeah, that, that is a great point. Cause yeah, it's not just even like, it, regardless of the industry, it's not just necessarily the industry within the walls, it would be their supply chain um, can have a significant impact on, on, you know, their productivity and ability to turn things around quickly and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another thing, Jim, you know, just in terms of success things is, is the whole process of sharing your success with others. And I've heard so many wonderful stories about how much it means to employees to be able to talk to other people, share their success and how much more they learn and how much they bring back to the work just from having those conversations. So, you know, I, I would encourage companies that are doing well uh, with Lean to, to go share the success because, you know, we're still, uh, there's, uh, the, you know, everybody practices this. We'll have better supply chains. We'll have, you know, we'll have better competition because you'll be competing yeah. against people that are trying to do the right thing, and and uh, they'll be training people well. And you know, yeah, you that's the, the the tide that raises all boats. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like we're, ultimately we're all consumers, so we'd like to, you know, maybe not necessarily our specific competitors, but you like to see everybody get better because that means us as consumers are getting higher quality products with more features at a better at a better price mm -hmm. yeah quality. exactly yeah well then that is by the way that's the only way growing productivity is the only way that we can improve the standard of living yes um, it's the only way we can do it and i'll i'll go out on a limb here and i'll say that that you look at what productivity is if it's doing more with the resources you have continuous improvement is the only sustainable way to do that. Yeah, yeah, I, my, my speculation, I don't know if you've got this either, would be um, productivity, continuous improvement is really the key, you know, key to the, or continuous improvement is really key to productivity. Sometimes technology can help you, but a lot of times even that technology may come out of somebody in their garage that's doing something else, but it usually comes out of iterative efforts of continuous improvement somewhere in the background. Of course, yeah. And in technology, I mean, we don't control that. We don't know if the next AI is going to go out, but we can control our productivity. So, uh, you know, we want to, like I say, we want to work on the things we can control the most. And, um, you know, but, uh, and then, of course, technology, understanding how to use it um, is you have to understand your processes. You can't expect to control it from outside the box just as a transactional sort of thing. You've got to understand, is this going to give us a better process? Okay. Well, somebody actually submitted a question, another question. They said, uh, how, how would you coach a leader to pivot away from measuring individual productivity? 
Well, I, you know, I would not personally take them on as, as a coach because I'm more of a journalist, but I would send them to one of the, you know, I think the, the industry is full of fabulous people like your organization that, that, that have all kinds of resources that do that sort of thing. So I would say uh, that's, that's it's very available both in the lean world and, and I would say the Deming world as well. I think they, uh, they would coach you about that, about looking at the whole system as opposed to a bunch of parts. Yeah, that's certainly certainly the, it's interesting how um, on a number of fronts, productivity is one is Deming's work and philosophy and teachings still to this day can impact us in a very positive manner. I think so. Sounds like that, that's what you found in your research as well. I, I did, I was really quite impressed and with the companies that had worked with his principles and the results they got, yeah. And there's a one. He has a wonderful book, you know, uh, the New Economics, which has is just very short but full of uh, wisdom. It's the last thing he wrote, and I think a lot of people focus on the 14 points. But I would say some of those insights in his later work is really uh, worth reading. Okay. Well, good. So, um, kind of getting towards the end here. Does anybody have any last questions they'd like to like to submit? And uh, waiting for anybody to do that. Um, I guess in the meantime, um, again, we um, you're in October, your uh, your book, Productivity Reimagined. You know, the, I guess the subtitle: Shattering Performance Myths into Achieve Sustainable Growth, which every organization and every industry looks towards trying to do that for the most part. So look forward to that book coming out, um, Jacob as well. Um, so I guess in a couple things here. Um, we thank you very much for presenting and uh, discussing this with us. Like I said, I find this subject so fascinating and and uh, there's a lot underneath of it. Um, so one thing you can do is look for links from Skylar coming up in the next 24 to 40 hours, a link from her that'll give you the recording of this webinar so you can review it and share it. Um, one other thing from Lean Frontiers, uh, speaking of productivity, in uh, September 17th through 20th, we actually have one of our skill point for job instructions coming up, which teaches one of the, I guess, the, like I say, one of the fundamental skills for continuous improvement related to this. So with that, I'd like to thank you, Jacob, and thank everybody for joining us. And thank you, Jim, for having me. Our pleasure.